Tak, až do příštího. The Legend of Sedina by Sir Arthur Quiller Couch. A puff of northeast wind shot over the hill, detached a late December leaf from the sycamore on its summit, and swooped like a wave upon the roofs and chimney stacks below. It caught the smoke midway in the chimneys, drove it back with showers of soot and wood ash, and set the townsmen sneezing, who lingered by their hearts to read the morning newspaper. <coughs> its strength broken, it fell prone upon the main street scattering its fine dust into fan-shaped fingers, then died away in eddies towards the south. Among these eddies, the sycamore leaf danced and twirled, now running along the ground upon its edge, now whisked up to the level of the first-story windows. A nurse, holding up a three-year-old child behind the pane, pointed after the leaf. Look! There goes Sadina! Sedina was the youngest son and the comeliness of King Geraint, who had left Arthur's court for his own western castle of Dingerin, in Roseland, where poor Scarlo now stands, <coughs> and was buried, when his time came, over the Nair in his golden boat, with his silver oars beside him. To fill his siege at the round table, he sent, in the lad's sixteenth year, this dinar, who in two years was made knight by King Arthur, and in the third was turned into an old man, before he'd achieved a single deed of note. For on the fifth day after he was made knight, and upon the feast of Pentecost, there began the great quest of the Sank Grail, which took Sir Lancelot from the court, Sir Percival, Sir Bors, Sir Gawain, Sir Galahad, and all the flower of the famous Brotherhood. And because after their going, it was all sad cheer at Camelot, and heavy, empty days, Sir Dinar took two of his best friends aside, both young knights, Sir Galholtim and Sir Uzanna Le Cour Hardy, and spoke to them of riding from the court by stealth. For, he said, we have many days before us, and no villainy upon our consciences, and besides our eager. Who knows, then, but we may achieve this adventure of the Sank Grail. These listened, and imparted it to another, Sir Centrail, and the four rode forth, secretly one morning before the dawn, and set their faces towards the northeast wind. The day of their departure was the next after Christmas, the same being the feast of Saint Stephen, the martyr, and as they rode through a thick wood, it came into Sir Dinar's mind that upon this day it was right to kill any bird that flew, in remembrance that when Saint Stephen had all but escaped from the soldiers who guarded him, a small bird had sung in their ears, and awakened them. By this, the sky was growing white with the morning, but nothing yet clear to the sight. And while they pressed forward under the naked boughs, their horses' hooves crackling the frosted undergrowth, Sadino was aware of a bird's wing ruffling ahead, and let fly a bolt, without warning his companions, who had forgotten what morning it was, and drew rain for a moment. But pressing forward again, they came upon a jeer falcon, lying with long loons tangled about his feet, and through his breast, the hole that Sadina's bolt had made. While they stooped over this bird, the sun rose and shone between the tree trunks, and lifting their heads, they saw a green glade before them. And in the midst of the glade, three pavilions set, each of red sandal that shone in the morning. In the first pavilion slept seven knights. (laughs) 
and in the second a score of damsels. But by the door of the third stood a lady, fair and tall, in a robe of Samite, who as they drew near to Acosta, inquired of them, Which of you has slain my dear falcon? And when Sir Dinar confessed and began to make his excuse, Silly knight, said she, who could not guess that my falcon too was abroad to avenge the blessed Stephen? What dost thou think? It was a hawk of all birds that sang a melody in the ears of his guards. With that she laughed, <laughs> as if pacified, and asked of their affairs, and being told that they rode in search of the sank grail, she laughed again, <laughs> saying, Silly knights, all that seek it before you be bearded, for three of you must faint and die on the quest, and you, sir, turning to Sodino, must many times long to die, yet never reach nearer by a foot. Let it be as God will, answered Sodino, but hast thou any tidings to guide us? I have heard, said she, that it was seen latest in the land of Gore, beyond Trentwater, and with her long white finger she pointed down a narrow glade that led to the northwest. So they thanked her, and pricked on, none guessing that she herself was King Urience's wife of Gore, and none other than Queen Morgan le Fay, the famous enchantress, who for loss of her jail falcon was lightly sending Sedina to his ruin. So all that day they rode, two and two, in the straight alley that she had pointed out, and by her enchantments she made the winter trees to move with them, serried close on either hand, so that though the four knights wist nothing of it, they advanced not a furlong for all their haste, but towards nightfall there appeared, close ahead, a blaze of windows lit, and then the tall castle, with dim towers soaring up and shaking to the din of minstrelsy, and finding a great company about the doors, they lit down from their horses and stepped into the great hall, Sedina leading them. For a while their eyes were dazed, seeing that sconces flared along the walls, and the place was full of knights and damsels brightly clad, and the floors shone. But while they were yet blinking, a band of maidens came, and unbuckled their arms, and cast a shining cloak upon each, which was hardly done when a lady came towards them out of the throng. And though she was truly the Queen Morgan the Fay, they knew her not at all, for by her necromancy she had altered her countenance. Come dance, said she, for in an instant the musicians will begin. The other three knights tarried a while, being weary with riding, but Sardina stepped forward and caught the hand of a damsel, and she, as she gave it, looked in his eyes and laughed. <laughs> she was dressed all in scarlet, with scarlet shoes, and her hair lay on her shoulders like waves of burnished gold. As Sardina set his arm about her with a crash, the merry music began, and floating out with him into the dance, her scarlet shoes twinkling and her tossed hair shaking spices under his nostrils, she leaned back a little on his arm and laughed again. <laughs> Sir Gulholtin was leaning by the doorway, and he heard her laugh, and saw her feet twinkle like blood-red moths. And he called to Sardina, but Sardina heard only the brassy music, nor did any of the dancers turn their heads. Though Sir Gaholtin called a second time, and more loudly, then Sir Centrail and Sir Ozana also began to call, fearing they knew not what for their comrade. But the guests still drifted by as they were clouds, and Sardino, with the red blood showing beneath the down on his cheeks, smiled always, and whirled with the woman upon his arm. By and by he began to pant, and would have rested. But she denied him. Ah, 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 for a moment only, he said, because I have ridden far today. But no, she said, 
and hung a little more heavily upon his arm, and still the music went on, and now, gazing upon her, he was frightened, for it seemed she was growing older under his eyes, with deep lines sinking into her face, and the flesh of her neck and bosom shriveling up, so that the skin hung loose and gathered in wrinkles. And now he heard the voices of his companions calling about the door, and would have cast off the sorceress and run to them. But when he tried, his arm was welded around her waist, nor could he stay his feet. The three knights, now seeing the sweat upon his white face, and the looks he cast towards them, would have broken in and freed him. But they too were, by enchantment, held there in the doorway. So with their eyes starting, they must needs stay there and watch. And while they stood, the boards became as molten brass under Sardinar's feet, and the hag slowly withered in his embrace. And still the music played, and the other dancers cast him never a look, as he whirled round and round again. But at length, with never a stay in the music, his partner's feet trailed heavily, and bending forward, she shook her white locks clear of her gaunt eyes, and laughed a third time, <laughs> bringing her lips close to his. And the poison of death was in her lips as she set them upon his mouth. With that kiss, there was a crash. The lights went out, and the music died away in a wail. and the three knights by the door were caught away suddenly and stunned by a great wind. Awaking, they found themselves lying in the glade where they had come upon the three red pavilions. Their horses were cropping at the turf beside them, and Sir Dinar's horse stood in sight a little way off. But Sir Dinar was already deep in the forest, twirling and spinning among the rotten leaves. And on his arm hung a corrupting corpse. <laughs> the whole day they sought him, and found him not, for he heard nothing of their shouts. And towards evening, mounted and rode forward after the sank grail, on which quest they died, all three, each in his turn. But Sir Dinar remained, and twirled and skipped, till the body he held was a skeleton. And still he twirled, till it dropped away, piecemeal. And yet again, till it was but a stain of dust on his ragged sleeve. Before this, his hair was white, and his face wizen with age. But on a day, a knight in white armour came riding through the forest, leaning somewhat heavily on his saddle-bow and was aware of an old, decrepit man that ran towards him, jigging and capering as if for gladness. He had caught him by the stirrup, and looked up with roomy tears in his eyes. In God's name, what art thou? asked the knight. He too was past his youth, but his face shone with a marvellous glory. I am young, Sir Dina that was made a knight of the round table, but five days before Pentecost. And I know thee, thou art Sir Galahad, who shouldst win the Sank Grail. Therefore, by Christ's power, rid me of this enchantment. <sighs> I have not won it yet, Sir Galahad answered, sighing. Yet, poor comrade, I may do something for thee, but I cannot stay thy dancing. So he stretched out his hand, and touched Sadina. And by this touch, Sardinar became a withered leaf of the wood. And when mothers and nurses see him dancing before the wind, they tell this story of him to their children. <laughs>